I'm Chris Harwood. If you don't know me, I'm the president of this New York chapter of SVU New York. Right away, uh, as always, to thank the BBLA, the Bohemian uh, Benevolent and Literary Association, which, which provides generous support to SVU to, for all of our programming. Uh, and also to thank our friend and colleague, Maida Kalab Whitaker, who was the one who kind of made the connection uh, between our organization and, and Nicholas Lowry, our presenter this evening. So let me introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Nicholas Lowry, who is president and principal auctioneer of Swan Auction Galleries and is also director of Swan's Vintage uh, Posters Department. He joined uh, Swan, which is uh, his family's business in 1995. And he is one of the foremost authorities really uh, in the world on vintage posters. And he spent nearly 20 years serving regularly uh, as the poster appraiser on PBS's Antiques Roadshow, where some of you may know him. And of course, Nick has a personal connection to things Czech. He has a Czech father who fled from Czechoslovakia with the family in 1938. And Nicholas himself uh, lived in Prague in the years immediately following the Velvet Revolution from 1990 to about 1994. And so uh, his topic for tonight, Czech vintage travel posters, is at the intersection of his professional uh, life in uh, auctioneering and in works on paper. Uh, and of course, his personal connection to things Czech. And so I think without taking up any more of his time, I'm going to turn it over. Anyway, thank you for that introduction. That was great, Chris. Very, uh, very thorough. You said everything that I wanted to say. <laughs> uh, and you probably said it better than I could, but I will just reiterate. Uh, it's so exciting for me to be here because this really is a confluence of all of my personal uh, and professional interests. Uh, as someone with Czech heritage, as someone who has lived in Prague, uh, as someone who has collected and dealt with vintage posters uh, for basically the duration of my professional career, uh, and as someone who loves Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic, Czechia, uh, and who loves to travel in general, to be able to speak to you all on Czech travel posters uh, is wonderful, like really great. And I appreciate the opportunity, Maida, thank you for, for putting us all together. And it wasn't lost on any of us when we were planning this, that we are all now relegated to our armchairs as armchair travelers, armchair professors, armchair quarterbacks, armchair every, we're all armchair everything right now. Uh, we are all restricted from traveling. And, uh, somehow that adds an extra special layer of poignancy to all of these things. Uh, some of us tonight are probably Czech nationals who haven't been able to go home for the past six months. Um, I certainly would have enjoyed visiting Prague in August as I do almost every year, but I didn't this year for the first time in about 15 years. Uh, but this is really a way for us to take a tour around uh, Czechoslovakia uh, from the comfort of our own homes and uh, I really, I hope you enjoyed as much as I do. You may hear the excitement level of my voice reach uh, a, a very extreme peak at some point. You, you'll see I, I get very excited over very little minute details. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll enjoy that. I do have one, uh, one apology uh, before I begin. Uh, those of you Czech speakers who are tuning in tonight, uh, I will have some captions in my presentation. Uh, every single, oh, not every single, but almost every single caption that I have does not have the correct Czech punctuation, uh, the accents, the diacriticals. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, it was a little too much over my head to figure out the Czech keyboard and how to put that into PowerPoint. So that's my apology. Um, also, budu mluvit v angličtině, jenom protože v češtině bude moc difficult for me. So I'm going to try to pronounce things properly. Thank you, Chris. Mute yourself before I hear you laughing at all of my bad Czech jokes. Thank you. Um, so let's begin. So uh, obviously before Czechoslovakia existed, uh, it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, and under the Habsburgs, uh, there was already a lot of uh, promotional activity trying to drive tourist traffic to Prague. And we're going to begin uh, in the early 1890s. And this is by no means the earliest Czech travel poster, but it's certainly one of the earliest. On the left, the poster by Wojtek Hinais, um, 
for the Grand Land Centennial Exposition. Those of you who were in Prague in 1991 may have also gone to Vista Vistia for this exhibition, which occurs every hundred years. Uh, this poster, which is rather academic in its design, um, and I should point out that's not a surprise, Wojtek Hinais is best known perhaps for having designed the, um, the curtain at Prague's National Theater. Uh, so you will have seen his work even if you don't know it. Uh, this poster advertises traveling to Prague for the exhibition. Uh, several things to notice here. First of all, uh, the poster is in French. So clearly this was being advertised outside of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, it was being advertised in France to drive French travelers, French tourists to Czechoslovakia, to um, the, the Habsburg Empire for this event. Uh, you'll also notice that on the two columns, uh, on the column on the left, you'll see in Czech, Umjeni, Veda, Przumysl, or, uh, Orba. And on the right, you'll see art, science, industry, and agriculture. Uh, the poster was also issued in Czech, and the poster was also issued in German uh, to appeal to as many different, uh, well, as many different travelers as possible to get that message out there. On the right, a uh, poster from a few years later, left behind from the exhibition, was Krzyzik's Fountain. Uh, again, I think some of you might be very familiar with this, still at Vista Vistia today, uh, water fountain with an incredible light show uh, and music. Uh, this you can see is dated 1895. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this poster was only issued in Czech. Uh, the thing about this that is most interesting to me, if you look at the crowd of people gathered below, all of the proud Czechs who have come to watch the show, you really see citizens from all walks of life. You see uh, rural citizens in their ethnic finery. You see city slickers in their hats and overcoats. Uh, it's a great cross-section of society and you get a really good idea um, of who they were hoping, who they expected to come and see this fountain. This is the poster that was used uh, in our promotion for the event tonight. Uh, it's by an Austrian artist named Gustav Jan. It's circa 1905. Uh, again, you'll see this is the French version, the Chemin de Fer de l'Etat Autrichienne, uh, the Austrian railway um, for travel to Bohemia, Bohem. One thing is, 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 is very ostensibly missing here, very, very obviously missing. The name of the city Prague. Uh, it's a lousy poster because it does not tell you where they are promoting travel to. They're just saying travel to Bohemia. Uh, on the bottom, you have two small vignettes. The vignette on the left is Karlstein, a uh, castle situated not too far from Prague. And on the right uh, is one of the many uh, sulfur fountains, uh, one of the sulfur fountains from one of the many Czech spas. We don't even know which one. Uh, but this is basically travel to Bohemia on the uh, state Austrian railway. Uh, in German, and we'll see this momentarily, in German, the railway was known as the Kaiserlich Künlichen Staatsbahnen, uh, the Imperial Royal State Airways. Uh, keep in mind, we're still living in Kaiser times now. 1908, uh, the Jubilaums Ausstellung. Again, we have a poster in German. This poster appears as well in French and in English. Uh, again, by an academic artist, uh, Václav, I'm sorry, Victor Oliva. Um, it's kind of hard not to giggle when you look at this poster. And if you wonder if it's possible that a grown man can still giggle when he sees breasts, it is possible. Uh, it is a very unusual ad in that they are using this diaphanously clad woman carrying uh, a medical staff and a wheel of commerce in her hand. Uh, staring at Hrachani, uh, sparkling golden in the setting sun uh, on the banks of the Vatava. Um, it's interesting to note that, um, it's not interesting to note, I found out in researching this poster, uh, this was uh, from May to October. This was the uh, celebration of the Kaiser's 60th year on the throne. Uh, Two months after this celebration was over, in December of 1908, uh, there was such a civil uprising 
in Prague that martial law was declared by the Austrian government. I had not known that before. Uh, many of these travel posters are reflective of the social and nationalistic tendencies that were happening at the time. And in looking at them, not only is it a trip around the world, it's also quite, um, it's also quite a history lesson. Uh, anyway, here this beautiful woman is inviting you to Prague to come enjoy the agricultural and the engineering feats of the Jubilaums Ausstellung in 1908. So in effect, it's not a travel poster in the tourism kind of way. It's sort of a commercial tourism. Uh, but moving on to the next slide now from 1910, we get right into the heart of uh, tourism, travel for travel's sake. And this is Bohemian Switzerland, Böhmische Schweiz, uh, also uh, a German version. I don't know that any other language exists. Uh, there on the bottom, you see inside the decorative element, you see a little train map. And it says KK Öster Staatsbahnen. And that stands for the KK Kaiserlich Königlichen Staatsbahnen, the Imperial Royal State Railways. Also, it should be noted, if you see the little figure on the, on the bottom right, the woman is incredibly well turned out. Uh, she is dressed for a wonderful day on the road. Uh, in 1910, it was the early days of automobiles. So you can see uh, that this was aimed more at the leisured classes. Uh, but just a beautiful view of uh, Bohemian Switzerland. Those of you who don't know, uh, it lies on the Czech side of the Elba Sandstone, Sandstone Mountains, north of Jechin. Uh, it straddles the Elba River, Bohemian Switzerland. Beautiful, beautiful place to visit. Uh, one of the main sources of tourism in uh, Czechoslovakia, and I'm just going to say Czechoslovakia now instead of distinguishing between uh, Czechia or the Czech Republic under the Austro-Hungarians, one of the main sources of tourism were the spa towns. Uh, and they were advertised very early on here uh, in 1900, circa 1900 and, and in 1910. Uh, on the left, you actually see a view of uh, Pojabrati Castle and the uh, Elba River. Uh, on the right, um, and you'll see me get into this a little bit later in the presentation, I'm fascinated by the buildings that the artists chose to depict in showing these towns. And I've tried to do research and figure out what all the buildings are. Uh, this building, I believe, no longer exists. I was unable to find it anywhere, uh, but I expect it to have been somewhere along the spa town's uh, promenade. The other curious thing about these two posters together, and this is a, a personal hypothesis. I have no idea whether it's true. Uh, in these two ads, both of these very stylish women are carrying a red umbrella. And it seems to me too exact a detail to just be coincidence. I don't know what that means. I don't know if there was a popular appeal of red umbrellas at the time, or if they were somehow signifiers of, of great status in society, but it seems very unusual to have these two posters separated by about a decade where each woman has a red umbrella. Uh, another ad for uh, Pojabrati, this is from 1912. Uh, you may be familiar with the illustrator on this one, Joseph Venig was uh, a children's book illustrator. Uh, and here they really point to the mineral water that comes from the spa. The woman on the right is holding a bottle of mineral water. Uh, the fellow on the left is actually holding a statue of George of Pojibrati, a uh, famous statue that's in the town. It's a statue by Bohuslav uh, Shuni. Uh, those of you who've been to Pojibrati will probably recognize that statue. Uh, very little today will I be talking about uh, the far east of Czechoslovakia about the Slovak lands. Uh, we'll save that for another presentation. But the farthest east we go today, well, I guess we get to the High Tatras, but almost the farthest east we go is Luhachovice, uh, spa town. Uh, this is, uh, these are both great pieces. Granted, the one on the left is, is from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The one on the right is from the Art Deco era. Uh, the one on the left features uh, sparkling water that was bottled at the town. It also features some of the bonbons and treats that guests to the spa could have had. But what's wonderful to me about the piece on the left, not only is it just this wonderful Art Nouveau image, 
uh, but it has some very accurate architectural details. So the woman in the hills is looking down over uh, the Yanuf Dom, which was designed by Dusan Jurkovic, uh, who's one of the best known promoters of Slovak art in the 20th century. Uh, and he designed a lot of buildings in Luhachovice between 1902 and 1907. Uh, and that's exactly how the buildings look, the bandstand uh, and the Yanov Dum. So the artist went to great detail to capture not only the beautiful surroundings of the land, but also what it would actually look like when you were there uh, and the products you could buy. On the right, uh, as I say, it's much later, 1932. The thing about this poster that really... Uh, catches my eye. I had mentioned the sort of nationalistic element of many of these pieces. Uh, I count no less than nine Czech flags in this image. I mean, it's a wonderful bustling image of life uh, on the promenade of the spa town, but there are nine Czech flags. There again in the background on the right side, you see that same uh, bandstand. Um, but a really just a, a great lively image. Uh, circa 1910, this is an unknown designer uh, for Melnik. Uh, and it's interesting, although there is a train line outlined uh, in the small map at the lower left, uh, no trains are advertised. So we don't know if this is the uh, Imperial Royal um, Railway. My guess is something like this for a town like Melnik was probably done semi-privately by people in the town itself. Uh, I'm going to put myself in a very precarious situation here uh, and say that Melnik is a very unusual place to imagine uh, tourism being promoted for. Uh, one of my dear friends was born in Melnik. I think he implanted that idea in my mind that there's nothing to see there at all. Uh, but in fact, here we have the Melnik Castle. Uh, Melnik sits at the confluence of the uh, Elba and the Vltava rivers. Uh, it is known for its uh, grape growing and its, and its vineyards, which you can see depicted along the right side there. If you look all the way in the background on the left side, you see a hill with a little castle on top of it. Uh, that's Rzip, uh, the famous hill that figures in the founding of the Czech lands. Uh, on top of it, that's the Rotunda of St. George that was built, I think, in uh, 1126 or thereabouts. So again, a really detailed piece. Uh, it is unclear uh, why this was designed, though. <laughs> Anybody who's from Melnik, uh, I apologize. All right, so now we come to the First Republic. Uh, in the years after the Second World War, when uh, Czechoslovakia had its statehood and became independent, uh, the tourism industry really began to flourish. And we're going to take a look now at a lot of the different kinds of advertising that were used, the kind of different places that they were promoting. Uh, there was a handful of what I consider very attractive, but rather generic ads that just showed uh, painterly renditions of locations around the country. Uh, here we have uh, the Waldstein Gardens uh, beneath the Prague Castle. Uh, we have the Vasoki Tatri in the middle with their renowned wooden houses and the uh, local people in their ethnic dress. And on the right, uh, we have a picture of a Yeshjed um, and the Yeshka Horny Hanichov cable car. The poster is from 1934. The cable car was opened in 1933. Uh, so again, some snapshots from around the country, uh, but again, all very painterly. And there, there was a large series of these uh, so on this slide here, uh, we see the Shumava Mountains, uh, we see uh, Lake Yezero, and of course we see uh, Karlstein Castle on the right. Um, like I said, all paintings, all very nice, not really all that different from a photographic postcard. Uh, and speaking of photographs, photographs were used to uh, also advertise travel. Uh, on the left, obviously, the probably the most famous view uh, from Prague of the Charles Bridge and the castle. And on the right, again, you have Karlstein. Uh, so little study has been done on these posters um, that we can really only approximate and say that these were done circa 1930s. Some of the painterly ones are actually dated, so we have a specific date. Um, but on these, uh, 
it could very well also, I suppose, be in the late 20s. We just don't know. Uh, you will see here on the bottom that they're advertising uh, not only in English, but they're specifically advertising a Cook and Son on Regent Street as a place to go to get tickets. If you like these photographs, that's where you can go. Uh, the next slide, I'm going to show you a detail of four of the pieces we've just looked at. Um, the Czechoslovakia was a very new country, and they were obviously working out a lot of kinks in their road to, um, to uh, efficient statehood. One of the things that they did not have down pat was a name for their uh, railway company. As you see on one of the posters, if you look at the small print on the top left, the Czechoslovak government railways. On the right top, you see the Czechoslovak state railways. Bottom left, you see the state railways of Czechoslovakia. And then you have the railways of the Czechoslovak state. Those all mean the exact same thing. Those are all advertising the exact same Ministry of Transportation. Um, but as far as corporate identity goes, it's very mishmashy and vague. So, you know, the 1920s and 30s were early on as the, as the government was trying to get their stuff together. One of the aspects of the country that was used to promote visiting uh, were uh, all the different wonderful and unusual and unexpected um, ethnicities of citizens. Uh, on the right, again, you have uh, Luhatrovice. And on the right, uh, you have a piece by an artist we're going to be seeing a lot more work from, uh, ours by the name of Ladislav Horak. Again, just to, to emphasize how, how vaguely studied this field is, I cannot even find dates of birth and death for Horak. Uh, very little biographical information is known about him. But take a look at these two posters, which more or less are showing the same thing. One on the left is very painterly, and on the one on the right now, we're getting to a much more graphic style. Also, you notice the one on the right uh, is in both German and Czech. Uh, obviously, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was a German-speaking country. Uh, official, German was the official language, and there were still many, many German speakers uh, in Czechoslovakia after the founding of the uh, country. Uh, and you'll see that in Horak's work, a lot of, uh, all of his images, not all of his images, a lot of his images uh, appear in both languages. Now we come to another image that was used uh, for promoting the event tonight. Le Boucher Le Parjova uh, was an artist uh, and she was very involved in promoting travel within Czechoslovakia for Czechs. Uh, and this again is a theme that resonates so much now as we are, uh, our travel is so curtailed. Uh, certainly in America, I've seen a number of articles about uh, you know, those of you who can't travel to Europe, those of you who can't travel that far afield, travel in your own backyard. And back in the 1920s and the 1930s, and again, madden maddeningly, uh, I don't know the exact date of this piece. Uh, back then, the Czech government was, for nationalist reasons, was trying to get their populace to travel around the country uh, and become more enamored with the Czech lands. Uh, if you haven't noticed here at the bottom, right above the text, right around the horse's knees and hooves, you'll see the skyline of Prague, uh, very artfully included there. And then the, um, the ethnic trumpeteers uh, with the Moravian coat of arms uh, and the Bohemian coat of arms, telling you, Vlastvola, your country is calling. Uh, and Vlastvola is a phrase that was used a lot during the First World War, so it would have been recognized, recognizable to many people, your country is calling, enlist in the armed services, enlist to fight in the war. Uh, and Vlastvala was also used by the Sokol movement. Um, so it was a phrase that a lot of Czechs would have been familiar with, and it takes on a whole new meaning, meaning here uh, in the hands of uh, Lepashova. Again, zero biographical information exists about her. Here are two more works by her. Uh, the one on the left, Sestuita Doma, Travel at Home. Uh, stay true to all the beautiful lands. Uh, you see uh, castles in the background. You see uh, ethnic citizens uh, in the foreground. And on the right, you see her work, an image of uh, Slovakia, the, uh, the, the Slovak Orient in French, directed at French tourists. On top, it even says, in 20 and a half hours, from Paris. 
so you get an idea uh, how long uh, the trip was. But you see that they were advertising the country um, both to citizens and to foreigners. And she did a really great job. Uh, more from Horak here in the 1930s. Uh, autumn in Bohemia and Moravia, Erbst, Podzim, Czechach, uh, Anna Moravia, uh, and Zima, Czechach, Anna Moravia. Just wonderful, wonderful themes. Uh, a man out hunting with his dog in autumn, a woman on the chairlifts probably of the Kirkenosha Mountains. Uh, we're going to be seeing a lot more uh, ski imagery coming up uh, because skiing was a big industry. Uh, as was golf. Golf was very, very popular uh, during the First Republic. Uh, on the left is an anonymous poster. Uh, and it's advertising golf uh, at four places, Carlsbad, uh, Karlo Vivari, Mariansky Lasnia, Pistian, and in, in Prague. Uh, but this particular image is of Mariansky Lasnia, and I know that because of the golf hotel, uh, which still exists today. It's now called, I believe, the Park Golf Hotel in uh, Mariansky Lasnia. Uh, and on the right, we see this wonderful couple driving up to a fancy house, I don't know what it is, uh, ready for a stylish weekend of golf. Golf really only features in the poster on the right uh, in the, uh, the tiny golf bag visible on the back of the caddy, sort of in the center of the poster. Otherwise, it's more of a lifestyle image. Also, keep, keep in mind the name of that art, artist, Zdenek Ricker. You're, we're going to see a lot more of his work uh, coming up. Uh, also, obviously, uh, not just uh, seasonal trips, but specific cities, uh, specific towns around the country would advertise. Here we have a poster for Kutna Hora. Uh, Zdenek Glukzelig actually was a Kutna Hora native. Uh, again, there are no train companies associated with the poster on the left, so I imagine it was done by a local chamber of commerce employing uh, a native son uh, to do the work. Uh, obviously, uh, Kutna Hora perhaps is most famous for its ossuary, but here uh, is the Tower of St. James Church. You can see that in the background, as seen through one of the buttresses, the flying buttresses of um, the Kram Svati Barbari, the uh, St. Barbara's Church. Uh, and that dome sort of right in the middle is the Jesuit College. On the right, the High Tatras, uh, German version here. Uh, but you see it is the Czechoslovak uh, State Railway. It is branded by them. And this is also by Zdenek Ricker. Uh, here we have uh, the French version for the Chateau de Hluboka uh, in Hluboka nad Vltavo, a town in South Bohemia with what is considered to be one of the most beautiful castles in the Czech Republic featured there. Uh, oddly, those of you who are familiar with the castle, it's now all white. Uh, I don't know if this is just supposed to be a white castle in the setting sun or if the whole edifice has been cleaned uh, since the 1930s. On the right, we have an English language version. Uh, it is a government publication. You see that by Zdenek Ricker in 1938. Uh, advertising once upon a time, the sort of fairyland aspect of Czechoslovakia, the castles and chateaus. Uh, you do see that cage there at the bottom, which is a cage they would put over wells in castles to keep detritus from falling into the wells. Uh, you probably are familiar with the one in one of the courtyards of, of the Prague castle, but they exist in other castles around the country. Uh, Ladislav Horak again. Ladislav Horak, uh, although very little is known about him, I would assume he was born in the vicinity of Yichin because he did a tremendous amount of work advertising um, local sites there. On the left, we actually have uh, Yichin, uh, the town square seen from above. And on the right, the uh, famous Prachovsky uh, Skali, the rocks of Prachov. Interesting here, we have the uh, English version on the left and the German version on the right. Uh, just to read you the small print that's on the bottom, uh, I'll read it in English uh, from the Yichin poster. It says, after a stay of six days during the summer season, visitors to Czechoslovakia, a reduction of 50%. After a stay of 10 days in the Czechoslovak spa, a reduction of 63, 66 and two thirds percent on the homeward journey. 
So they were basically saying you could come home cheaper if you stayed in Czechoslovakia longer. Another poster for Yichin uh, by Horak uh, from 1935. Uh, and I mentioned to you that my voice might get a little excited at certain points during this presentation. Uh, I have made it a pet hobby of mine when I have the opportunity to go around Czechia now, finding images in posters and recording them. Uh, this was one, I was in Yichin in August of 2019 and I took a picture which I thought most closely uh, aligned with the poster that Horak designed uh, in the 1930s. And you can see how incredibly he, accurate he was from the seal uh, in the middle of the clock tower to the, all the different windows and the archways. Uh, it all lines up really nicely. Uh, and I cannot emphasize how much joy it gives me to put those two images together. Uh, here Horak focuses on the rock climbing uh, on the rocks of Prakov. Uh, German version again. Now we have a different aspect of that area, uh, the railway trip to get there that goes through the rocks, uh, a French version of a poster by Miloš Endler, uh, circa 1930. And we know that it's circa 1930, in this case, as opposed to 35, because this image appears on the cover of a railway calendar from 1930, the exact same image, the painting. So we assume the poster was done uh, simultaneously, or certainly uh, within the chronographic uh, area of 1930. And on the right, uh, Turnoff, uh, there we have um, uh, Hruba Scala, uh, and in the background, the Trotsky Castle in the distance. Uh, the artist, Karel Vick, uh, again, was a native to the region, um, and uh, most likely why he was asked to do this uh, you can see in the bottom, Propagachny Vibor Turnovska, um, the, uh, the Turnoff Propaganda Department. This was not done by one of the national railway companies. It was put out by a local um, chamber of commerce, presumably, but a great view. And this next one, this is not a picture that I took. This was a picture I did find on the internet, uh, but you just see how, how true to life the, the woodcut that, um, Karel Vick did was of Ruba Scala. Just a great comparison there, I think. Those of you who are familiar with the uh, rocks of Prachov, I mean really familiar, might know that in 1938, a public swimming pool was opened uh, on the grounds there. Uh, the picture on the left is again Horak uh, showing uh, that swimming pool. Uh, it looks nothing like that. And I did track it down and I did take a picture and the picture is so disappointing and so depressing compared to this wonderfully colorful view that Horak presents us that I didn't want to give it to you side by side. I thought I would just show you another great aerial view that he did this time of Telch uh, in the 1930s. One of the other most famous tourist towns in Czechoslovakia was Chesky Krumlov. Uh, as famous as this town is, as beautiful as this town is, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and so on and so forth, these are, to my knowledge, the only two posters, the only two posters from the First Republic advertising travel to this town. Uh, I just find that really hard to believe. I, I may be applying a modern advertising sensibility to a more old-fashioned uh, situation, uh, but it really surprises me. These are the only two that I've been able to find. And from my conversations with curators and Czech museums, uh, they tend to agree with me on that. Uh, Karlstein, uh, another great location. Uh, these posters by Zdeněk Ricker. I put these two side by side simply so that you could see uh, the same poster in different languages, obviously English on the left uh, and French on the right. Oddly, these posters are different dimensions. The poster on the right is slightly more elongated. You can see there's more of the image uh, toward the bottom. Uh, and it's not that the image on the left has been, has been trimmed or cut off. Uh, it was just printed that way for, for no apparent reason. All right, now we come to the mother of all cities, Prague. Um, I'm trusting that every one of you who's tuned in now uh, has been there or at least is familiar with it. Uh, the mother of all cities, the city of a, of a thousand spires, 
uh, the city that inspired many great poster artists. This is Karel Vick, who did the poster for uh, Turn Off. We saw a few slides ago. This from 1924, a view of the city uh, from uh, outside the castle. Again, you'll notice the poster is in French, advertising uh, to a French marketplace. The British also got into it. This is a poster printed in England by a French, uh, by French, by a British artist named Frank Newbold, uh, done for the uh, LNER railway, uh, depicting Charles Bridge. Uh, take a look closely. You'll see uh, a lot of people from around Czechoslovakia in their ethnic wear on the bridge. So the city was a major metropolitan area, and from all over the country, people would join. But you get a you get a great feeling for the for the scope, and I think we're all familiar with this view. A closer view of Charles Bridge by Milos Endler here from 1929. And keep in mind that Endler was the artist of some of the more painterly posters that we saw earlier. Uh, this is a great piece. Uh, not only do you see uh, cosmopolitan people on the bridge and more rurally dressed ethnic citizens on the bridge, but you also see a wonderful car. Uh, and not only do you see a car though, you see a car driving on the left side of the bridge. Uh, Czechoslovakia, like the United Kingdom, had a left side traffic system uh, prior, ironically, prior to the German invasion. So once the Germans invaded Bohemia and Moravia, to make it easier for them, they switched the whole country over to right-hand side drive. Uh, to be fair, that was in the works before the Germans invaded, but the Germans just sped that up. Um, so this is just a great image. It show, all, by the way, you also see a car on the bridge, which you don't see anymore. Uh, so not only is it left-hand drive, but it's a, a car on the bridge. Shows how times have changed. Uh, this slide is a combination. You have what we saw earlier uh, on the left, the photographic poster uh, of Charles Bridge. In the middle, you have the graphic version of the exact same shot. Uh, and on the right, you have a poster for the Czechoslovak State Railways showing uh, Charles Bridge from the other side. Uh, I'm sure you've all walked by that statue a million times. Did you know it's the Knight of Brunswick statue designed by Ludwig Schimek? Also of interest here, look, the poster in the middle, Praha uh, CRS, the Czech, uh, CSR, sorry, the Czech and Slovak Republic. And on the right, uh, it's CSD, uh, the Czechoslovenski Statny Drahi. So one is promoted by the country, the other is promoted by the railway. I, I don't know exactly what that proves, but I thought it was worth pointing out. Uh, this is a poster printed in Belgium. Uh, in ninth, circa 1937 by Edmund Morris, who was a Belgian artist. Again, just a wonderful graphic view. Niège de Art, Art of Snow, uh, Charles Bridge in the Winter. Fabulous image. Here's Horak again. Um, do you know where this is? I know you can't answer. It's sort of a rhetorical question. Uh, for the longest time, I thought this was the square in Malostrana outside St. Nicholas Church. Um, and that road to the left going up um, up to the castle. But no, if you look in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see the shadow of the Prague Bridge Tower. Uh, this is the square um, right by Karlovo Street. Uh, and again, you see cars and buses leaving the bridge uh, and going into, into downtown Prague one there. Uh, just a great, great graphic image. Again, Horak really had a, a knack for that. And I think one of the most graphic images of Prague is this one, again, by Zdeněk Ricker from 1937. Uh, he captures the romantic twilight feel so incredibly well. It's so still, you can see a fish jump and the ripples on the Vlatava. Just an incredible, uh, incredible image, this one. And he definitely had a thing for atmosphere. This is Daniel Ricker, again, 1937. Uh, German version, Prague, the Rome of the North. The Rome of the North, there's St. Nicholas Church, illuminated uh, against the shadow of, of, of the castle uh, and Malastrana. The phrase, Rome of the North, uh, if you research it, is very hard to pin down. Uh, 
It's been attributed to August Rodin, uh, the sculptor who visited Prague in 1902, but it's also clearly a holdover uh, from the medieval years when Prague was the seat of the Holy Roman Empire. So Prague, the Rome of the North. I'm, I'm not sure it's a phrase we hear that much anymore, but it was certainly thrown around a lot then. Uh, more by Zdeniek Ricker, more atmospheric uh, shadow images, just great colors, purples, yellows, uh, oranges, ochres. Um, again, on the right, if you look at the bottom, 50 to 66 and two thirds reduction on the homeward journey. Uh, those of you who are in marketing, perhaps you could explain to me what they thought to gain by advertising a cheaper return trip, but I guess it was a savings of some sort. Um, but obviously it appears everywhere. Uh, another one by Ricker here, Prague, uh, the Baroque city, sort of a wonderful pastiche of uh, different sculptures on Charles Bridge and, and different uh, buildings and the cathedrals. Uh, here in 1947 and 1949, we have two later advertisements for Prague done by the Atelier BNR. Uh, the one on the left, uh, takes its cue from a book of folding postcards. Uh, you can see uh, coming out of the Prague city crest, right from out of the gates, the, the accordion fold is unfolding. You see the Belvedere Castle there and Charles Bridge and the Tin Church. Uh, and then on the right, just a great mid-century modern design uh, for the river uh, and uh, the structures along the uh, old town side of the river. Uh, sort of a very minimalist uh, aerial view, but you can recognize all the bridges. And then finally, uh, finally for Prague anyway, this isn't quite uh, Prague itself, it's the outskirts of Prague, the Barendorf Terraces. Uh, this incredible Art Deco functionalist photo montage, you see that half of the image, or I don't know, a third of the image on the lower right is a photograph that seamlessly blends into this extraordinary Art Deco design by Herska. Uh, just look how fashionably dressed that woman is uh, and how elegant and glorious the whole place looks. It uh, was a real destination. Um, and even though the headline Zaprahova uh, Pretze v Praze is in Czech, you then have Visit Barandov, Visite Barandov, and Besucht, Besuchet Barandov. So all three languages there um, appealing to a, a large cross section of potential visitors to go dine uh, this elegant, elegant terrace at Barendorf. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we'd be hearing a lot more about skiing. The ski mountains uh, were definitely a draw. Um, and we'll see all sorts of different ads. This again, you have uh, a, an image that's branded Czechoslovakia, uh, CSR on the left and the right here. Uh, two posters from the 1930s really just atmospheric, look mountains, look, I can ski and look at these beautiful trees. On the right, at least you have a woman who is so fashionably dressed that you get an idea for what they were implying uh, for the people who would come skiing. Here a very artistic image, I think, a lone skier at the end of his ski tracks, uh, uh, ski tracks and pole marks there visit the winter sports centers in Czechoslovakia, obviously done for the English market. Um, you see the different areas that they advertise, Krkonoše, Šumová, the uh, Vysoký Tatry, and so on. But a large part of the advertisement was geared towards um, the Krkonoše mountains, the giant mountains. Uh, again, we have two different languages here. Um, I cannot tell you the time that I spent trying to figure out what these buildings were. Uh, I was able to figure out the one on the left. The one on the left is the famous uh, Sokolska Boda Hotel, which opened in 1929. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, you just missed it. Uh, it was demolished in 2019. It was derelict for many years, but it was only recently demolished in 2019. But it was just a massive, impressive structure. Uh, and here's a little inside tip. Uh, if any of you find yourself in the position where you need to identify old buildings and posters, uh, the best way that I found to do this is by looking at old postcards. Uh, and the internet is a great wealth of information on that regard. So uh, you can find old postcards of the Sokolska Boda Hotel and you'll see it looks exactly like it. The one on the right, regrettably, uh, I was not able to figure it out. 
Uh, I can tell you though that the cable car uh, is in uh, Chernohora. It's the Janske Lasnya cable car. Uh, it's the first one that opened in Czechoslovakia. It opened in 1933. Uh, there were only two cars. There was number one and number two. Uh, one went up, the other went down. Oddly, again, no explanation for this. We'll see another poster uh, featuring this cable car. Uh, it also features the second car, car number two. For some reason, uh, I don't know why, no poster artist advertising this part of, the, of Czechoslovakia uh, used a car number one. Oh, there on the right, you see car number two again. On the left, uh, we're actually leaving Krkonosha just for a second. We're going to the High Tatras. Uh, anybody recognize that hotel? That hotel is still there. Uh, that's the Grand Hotel Kempinski uh, in Strupske Pleso. Uh, and on the right, uh, I say designer unknown. I believe this is also the work of Zdeněk Ricker. Uh, there was a great show of his work uh, at the Veloturčne Palac a few years ago. They printed a wonderful catalog. Uh, it was not a complete catalog, though, and they only had about half a dozen of his travel posters. Um, but I believe this is his work. Uh, that building is the Lapska Boda Hotel, uh, which burnt down in 1965. But again, if you look at old postcards and you find the Lapska Boda Hotel, uh, you will see it. And if you look in the background, you'll also see a bus that's bringing skiers to the hotel. So it's really showing that if you come to spend your winter in Czechoslovakia or take a winter trip in Czechoslovakia, uh, you'll have all of these amenities at your disposal. Uh, Ladislav Horak, 1946, Velky Karlovice on the left, and of course in the Kirkonesha Mountains, Spindler Roof Mlin uh, on the right. Curious though, why depict a wooden doll to advertise a ski resort? Uh, and I don't have a solid answer for you there, um, but I will say it's possible that this doll was modeled after a Spabel uh, Hrvanik. Uh, dolls were made famous in the 1920s, uh, wooden dolls. Uh, it sort of looks like one of them if you squint your eyes and you know who they are. Uh, but it is a very curious advertising conceit. Uh, then we have these two great posters um, for the High Tatras and the one on the right in Fair Play is not a ski poster. Uh, the one on the left uh, actually features little posters that were used as stickers also. Um, the poster of the bear with the umbrella for Star Smokovets. I've seen for sale once in 1998. I haven't seen it for sale since. Great piece. Uh, and the piece on the right, again, is just showing, you know, a very simple graphic uh, conceit to show one image with many different little images from around the country to get people sort of uh, excited to travel there. Uh, this is the final ski poster I'm going to show. It's 1959. Uh, it's just a, just a very happy piece. And in my mind, it plays off of that uh, Spindler Roof and Lean poster because these two characters sort of look like puppets to me or dolls. Uh, and I have to imagine that the artist was um, somehow channeling that earlier poster. Now we're almost done. I mean, I could talk for hours and hours. I wanna show you just three more slides now. Um, you know, in order to travel to and around Czechoslovakia, uh, there needed to be modes of transportation. Uh, and probably the single most famous mode of transportation in Czechoslovakia in the 1930s was the um, Slovenska Strela, the Slovak Arrow. This was a modernist train, uh, a legend of the First Republic. This train was so beautifully designed and this train was um, so popular that it became a source of national pride. I, I would imagine that almost every citizen of Czechoslovakia was aware of it. Uh, it was a high-speed train traveling between Prague and Bratislava, making a stop in Brno. On the right, we see visit Brun, Brun visit Brno. Uh, you can see on the, on the train on the lower right, Praha, Brno, Bratislava. Uh, the train could make the run in four hours and 51 minutes. Um, apparently, I'm told by Wikipedia that that record wasn't broken until very recently. Uh, so it was just a, a high-speed train train that everybody was proud of. Uh, the one on the left is one of the great Art Deco uh, transportation graphics out of uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, popular in European posters to show the telegraph lines along the train tracks, which you can see in the background there. And then this sort of three-quarter view of the impressive engine uh, 
by uh, Willem Rotter. Uh, really great. Uh, the train was retired. It only ran for a few years. Uh, it was put out of regular service in 1939 with the onset of the Second World War. And uh, another area of transportation that I just want to touch on, and if uh, the situation allows itself, if, if the stars align and the SVU would like me to do another one of these presentations, I can go much deeper uh, into both modes of transportation and another area that we haven't looked at at all, uh, one of the most popular tourist sources in Czechoslovakia were the spa towns. We've only seen a few spa posters at the top of the presentation, but uh, in a future pr presentation, I can get more deeply into that. Uh, uh, Czechoslovensky Štátny Aroliny was formed in 1923. Uh, the poster on the left uh, is from the very early days of the airline. Um, there you see Mercury, Mercury flying alongside one of the aircraft. And on the right from the 1930s, uh, Willem Rotter again, this wonderful Art Deco image, the plane, because in addition to identifying buildings and old posters, I'm a train spotter, a plane spotter. Uh, the plane is a Fokker F7B3. Uh, and just in case you want to know how I figured that out, uh, the call letters, the OK, those of you who fly Czech Airlines today will recognize the same call letters, OK. OK, ABM uh, was a Fokker F7B. Uh, do you notice on this poster on the right, uh, Mercury's legs extending out below the plane and running along with it. It's like running the plane along. Uh, I think it shows how commerce can be uh, increased by using air traffic. And I've got one more poster to show you uh, before the end here. Uh, this is just a great Czech airline poster. This is one of these posters that um, you see online all the time, but I was lucky enough to find one in person. And I should say that every single image I have shown you today are posters from my collection. Um, it's a collection that I have in conjunction with my father. Uh, he began collecting posters many, many years ago, and I grew up surrounded by a lot of them and was bitten by the bug early. Uh, we have hundreds in our collection, but everything I've shown you today is in that collection, including this poster, uh, circa 1965. Um, uh, the IL-18 was a Russian turboprop plane that became very popular uh, throughout, uh, very popular throughout the uh, Soviet sphere. Uh, and I think the artists here who were paying uh, political homage to the Russian aircraft were also paying homage to the psychedelic movement that was spreading around the Western world. Uh, the colors on this are actually much more vibrant uh, in real life than they are on this image, but you get a really great idea. And with that, uh, I'm going to wrap it up um, and say thank you for your attention. I don't know if I was talking too fast to um, keep people from asking questions or if anybody has any uh, questions at all that I can answer now, it would be a pleasure to do so. Well, thank you, Nico, so much for uh, taking us on that uh, very loving tour of something that uh, uh, clearly is very, very dear to your heart and that you have vast uh, knowledge and experience of. I've been monitoring uh, the chat, uh, and I think so far it's mostly been uh, a few people connecting who, who knew each other uh, or are getting acquainted over the chat and a few kind of uh, other comments, a few general statements of thanks for this evening's program, but I don't think I see yet any explicit questions there. If, if I've missed one, maybe you could try uh, resending that question. Um, but uh, maybe while we're waiting for... Uh, uh, well, I see, uh, I see oh, a I question see, now. I see it. Oh, oh, now they're rolling. You ask me. Okay, so I'll read this question. Uh, thank you, it was wonderful. Uh, did Mucha uh, do no posters for Czechoslovakia? So this is a this is a great question, uh, and uh, we actually discussed this, uh, Chris, you, I, and Susanna, the other evening. Uh, Muka didn't design travel posters per se for Czechoslovakia, but Muka did design posters advertising events uh, and festivals that said "Come to Ivanchice," uh, the town where he was born, for example. So they were in effect promoting travel, but it was more uh, promoting Czech culture and of cultural events that were taking place. Uh, it's, a, it's a fine line, uh, but he definitely has a small handful of those. And 
most I, I don't have those in my collection, but I can certainly uh, include them in a subsequent presentation. Very good. Thank you for that response. Uh, the next question, the, the, <laughs> the chat is really humming now, so it's tricky to uh, find these. Good. Yeah, there was one question. Why is it that Czech posters are rarer than, for example, Swiss, Swiss or Belgian posters? That, that's also a great question. And I promise you, I'm not kissing anybody's uh, tuchis here when I say these are great questions. These are great questions. I would have no problem telling you it was a bad question. Um, one of the reasons that these posters are so rare is that when the communists invaded Czechoslovakia in 1948, they did their best to eradicate most forms of capitalism. And this actually included going to printing houses and throwing leftover papers, advertisements out the window and setting bonfires in streets. So the posters that exist now, the Czech posters that exist now, exist almost entirely uh, from people who saw their beauty at the time and saved them. Uh, you know, if you, if you collect French posters, a lot of times dealers might go to the basement of a French printing, French printing house and find loads and loads of posters all wrapped up as they were left there hundreds of years ago. That does not happen in Czechoslovakia. Those ads were destroyed by the, uh, by the Russians when they invaded. Oh, that's an interesting development. Uh, uh, a question, what would the estimated values of some of these posters be? Um, some of them do come up for sale with some frequency. Some of them really don't come up for sale at all. So, for example, one of the posters was Zdeněk Ricker's uh, orange uh, atmospheric nocturnal view of, of the Vltava with the bridges across the river. That's come up for auction in New York. Uh, and tends to sell for about three or four thousand um, dollars. The sort of yellow and blue uh, view of Charles Bridge, uh, the one that was that I, I juxtaposed with an actual photograph of the same image, that would sell maybe in the eight hundred nine hundred dollar range if if you can find it. Um, again, you know, uh, circling back to the previous question. Those posters that were printed in other languages that were shipped out of the country to, say, um, Czech Railways offices on Fifth Avenue in New York or in Regent Street in London, those also had the possibility of being saved uh, by people who saw them and fell in love with them. And any of you who have the poster bug will know that sometimes falling in love with these pieces uh, is pretty immediate and they, they inspire a, 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 a real emotion that makes people want to keep them or steal them. <laughs> Understandably. Uh, I'll just share a couple of comments that appear on the chat. Uh, one uh, uh, member of the audience uh, commented, as I think many of us would, that this is amazing and we would love another future talk. Most Thank you. So, I, if, if, if you would allow it, I, if, if it's not clear to any of you, this stuff turns me on on a level that's uh, very difficult to imagine. For those of you who doesn't turn on, my, my girlfriend doesn't like it. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, I love I love doing this. I like I said at the beginning, I love posters. I love now Czechia, uh, and this is it's a pleasure for me. So if we could do another one, that would be great. Well, we'll certainly look into the possibilities of a, a reprise. Another uh, contribution to the uh, the chat, uh, hurrah! Uh, apparently, the Slovak Aero Train has recently been renovated. So that's, that's an exciting I was reading about idea. that, and I think it's on view in one, I'm not sure if it's the Prague Technical Museum, but I believe it is on view somewhere. Uh, I have not seen it yet, but anybody who's into to modern design should make a pilgrimage to see that train. I mean, it was that kind of special. Uh, there's a conjecture here uh, that maybe the puppet was on the poster because of the Czech tradition being famous for their puppetry. Uh, you know what? Absolutely right. And I, I, I'd thought about that, and then I got into the weeds, and I found those two, uh, Herbel and, and, and what's his face? And Spabel and Horvinek, yeah. Spabel, yeah, Spabel, thank you. Uh, and I thought that might be it, uh, because, but it could very well be the, the Czech tradition of wooden toys. Absolutely. Now I'm trying to... Fine, where is that? Uh, a couple of comments, looking forward to the next one already. All right. Um, a question here, how well were some of these artists known as either commercial artists or fine artists? Would it have been something like the phenomenon of an Andy Warhol who was known for both kinds of work? Again, a great question. Uh, by and large, these were not famous artists. Uh, 
I, several times I mentioned how maddening it was that I couldn't even figure out when these people were born and when they died. That's crazy. Uh, I, I assume it would be a little bit easier if I spoke fluent Czech, which I don't, but I am in touch with a lot of curators in uh, Czechia now, and they were unable to help me. So the information just may not exist. Some of the more painterly pa uh, posters were done by artists um, who were known painters, but no one was ever famous. Um, of the ones I showed you, probably the most famous uh, would have been Willem Rotter. Uh, he had a studio in England for a while. Um, uh, again, I wouldn't say he was famous. I would just say he was the most well-known. Uh, Ladislav Horak, whose work is really among the best of all Czech travel posters, nothing is known about him. Um, so uh, uh, Karel Vik from the uh, Turnov region was a known painter, uh, but again, uh, you know, his paintings might only sell for, you know, in the high hundreds, certainly not thousands of dollars. So not, not famous at all on the, on the level of a Warhol. Hmm. Okay. Uh... Question here, are Czechoslovak posters from the interwar period different from other Central European posters that would be aimed at attracting foreign tourists? Uh, not really. I mean, the interwar period was the golden age of travel. Uh, it was the dawn of the aviation era. It was, uh, people were still traveling by train and throughout France and throughout England and throughout Germany, there was very, very active graphic work being done to promote traveling. Um, so they're different in that they're different artists and they look slightly different. Um, but generally speaking, they are of the same mold as the rest of, of Europe. Uh, an interesting question here, taking us a little uh, maybe beyond the topic of something you might know about. Uh, you mentioned the communist period. Did Czechoslovakia have the same creative almost subversive poster response that Poland did in terms of film and theater posters. I'm thinking of equivalents to Poland's cirque or film posters. Yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna say that's an excellent question because Angelina Lippert, who is the curator of the Poster House Museum here in New York City, uh, uh, always asks great questions. So I don't need to <laughs> out of her by telling her how good it was. Um, the, the Polish tradition was unique in its subversiveness. Uh, Czech interwar posters, and I have a number of those uh, that I could show uh, in a subsequent presentation, were not nearly as subversive. Uh, to be fair, I think the Polish posters, yeah, you, you say it, the Polish film posters were subversive. Uh, the Czechs had a very active film poster industry in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, uh, which were great. And they certainly were subversive to a degree, but not nearly as much as the Polish ones. Okay. Uh, yeah, someone chiming in on how interesting a question that was. Um, let's see. Uh, are you giving any other poster talks in the near future? So Angelina's lobbing softballs here all over the place. So okay. uh, through, through the poster house uh, in New York City, uh, we do uh, bi-monthly fireside chats uh, where Angelina and I discuss posters. Uh, we also have once a month starting in October, uh, we do uh, vintage posters and uh, vintage cocktail making. Uh, so I would encourage you to look at the Poster House Instagram page. Absolutely. Uh, also, um, I'm going to just throw out a little, a little self-serving promotion. On, um, uh, in October, on October 17th, uh, Swan Galleries is going to be having an auction of rare and important travel posters. And while wow. there are none from Czechoslovakia in the sale this year, you will be able to see many extraordinary examples from America, from Germany, from England, from France, from Italy, from Switzerland. Uh, and that catalog should be up online uh, by this time next week. And if you like looking at posters, I would encourage you to look at the catalogs. Um, it's a heavily annotated catalog, so you'll be able to read and learn a lot about them. Uh, there endeth my plug. Very good. Uh, kind of related question, is there a current or planned uh, exhibition of these posters? No, you know, there isn't. Uh, they've been on exhibition twice before, once at the Poster Museum in Horn, uh, outside of Amsterdam, that's H-O-O-R-N, Horn, mm -hmm. uh, and once in Cedar Rapids in Iowa at the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library. 
uh, in 2016, I believe they were on exhibition, not all of them, but a selection. Uh, if you are writing or uh, texting this question from an institution with a large exhibition hall and would like to have an exhibition of these, it would be uh, a pleasure for me to help you organize that. Okay, very good. Uh, the, the gauntlet is thrown. Uh, here's a, a question. Not too many women designers. Why is that? It's interesting. The graphic design world uh, was by and large uh, inhabited by male artists, not female. And that's for every single country uh, around the world. Um, we did see several extraordinary examples uh, from La Pajova, uh, La Boucher, um, and those are great. Those are among the greatest and the most important too. I mean, she was uh, ground zero at the, at the intersection of the Czech government trying to promote tourism among its populace uh, for its country. Uh, so I think that signifies that she was given a very, very high place in the hierarchy. Um, just conjecture, by the way. But the fact that there are a few women is consistent with the rest of the world. Uh, no, very few women designed posters in that era. Uh, just someone chiming in that they were fortunate enough to see the exhibit in Cedar Rapids. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you went. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's great. I just say the people at the, the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library are wonderful. Uh, they are currently having their Brunost celebration uh, for the past three years. Actually, as a result, <laughs> how's this? As a result of doing the exhibition there in 2016, uh, I became their auctioneer for their annual fundraiser, Brunos, <laughs> which is a food and drink extravaganza. Uh, so I spent a lot of time out there and I'm, I'm very happy to have gotten to know all of them. Terrific. Uh, I just had one question. I was fascinated to see so many works by uh, Zdenek Reke, uh, who I had known more from the fine arts side of thing and, and in particular, uh, also, sort of the, the very interesting story of his relationship with his wife, the the uh, you know, the modernist uh, writer, Milada uh, Sochkova, and I was surprised to see so much. He done so much extensive uh, uh, work in the commercial area, but his a lot of his works do look a little different, don't they? They they have a more sort of uh, intense um, kind of tonality, at least, and in some cases, composition. I already felt something a little bit uh, surrealistic in some of the kind of collagey. Uh, compositions he was using there was was he kind of a lone wolf uh, with that style in in the genre? Well, he was he was a fascinating individual. Uh, his biggest client he was a painter he was an artist but his biggest commercial client was Orion Chocolates, uh, uh -huh. and he designed candy wrappers, um, and uh, many of his posters can be seen as candy wrappers. Big bright bold graphic, catch your attention, pop the chocolate into your mouth, take a trip, um, uh -huh. you know. Uh, tragically, he actually committed suicide in 1940. Uh, he threw himself uh, off a train bridge uh, as a result of the Nazi occupation. Yeah, yeah, very his sad. His life story. was cut short. But no, he was a very, he was a very peripatetic artist. Uh, in fact, I was reading through a catalog. Uh, I mentioned he had an exhibition at the Velotirzny Palazzo, and I was looking through the catalog last night, uh, and I forgot to write down the quotation. But they were saying his style was so varied. Um, which isn't always a good thing in an artist necessarily, but they're saying his style is so varied that it shows he had many interests. They, they tried to couch it in a positive way. Yeah, well, why not? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was interested too, just to see um, uh, that you, a great many styles demonstrated in, in the, the range of post you shows from, from Art Nouveau uh, to some kind of functionalist looking things to just, you know, very kind of conventional 20th century commercial art, who, as I said, you know, the kind of, you know, implications of surrealism in, in, in Ricker's work, and then, and then the, the deco style that kind of recapitulates aspects of the Art Nouveau. I was surprised at how difficult I, a time I had guessing the year that any given poster would come from. There were things that looked to me to be Art Nouveau, and they were from the 20s, right? Or, uh, uh, other things, you know, that I just sort of, I would have guessed wrong based on how I associate these styles in, in high art. Is there an extent to which maybe in commercial art, the, uh, the styles have kind of a, a greater longevity? That's a, that's a fascinating question. I'll use a new adjective. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, Chris. I really don't. Um, 
you know, there's, there's so much to be gleaned from, from studying these pieces, whether it is historical or architectural. I mean, the fact that, that putting this presentation together got me into the weeds on Slovak architecture uh, in Eastern spas, I thought was fantastic. Um, and uh, the, I'm sure there's a lot to be learned too about, about um, commercial styles. I would think that commercial style would follow after the traditional artistic style. So they, you know, these, they might've been cutting edge designs, but they weren't the, they didn't create Art Deco for the poster world. They saw Art Deco, they loved Art Deco, and they applied Art Deco to their commissions. Yeah. That makes sense. And of course, there's the whole distortion that we get from our academic art history, which tends to look at the people who were the cutting edge, right? And, and not, you know, not really reflecting when the sort of the innovations uh, that they made were then sort of uh, multiplied, right? And, and uh, became sort of common, uh, uh, common currency. Uh, just a couple more comments here from veterans of this, uh, this business. Uh, uh, we have some people who saw the Mucha exhibit at the poster house, which was outstanding, and are particularly interested in the ones he did for Sokol, mm -hmm. uh, as uh, my late father was involved in uh, Sokol Cleveland and my daughter took gymnastics at Sokol, New York. So we have connections there. Um, and another uh, veteran, another uh, person who attended the Cedar Rapids exhibition said it was absolutely worth the trip to a wonderful area. Um, as the travel post is promoted, travel at home and see your own country. Yeah, it's amazing too, the, the uh, similarity to our current situation, to what we just looked at is, is facet chilling almost. I mean, it's amazing to think that right now, any of us who wanted to go to Europe may be stuck going you know, across state lines and we're gonna enjoy it. And we're gonna see things in our own backyard that we never imagined were there. And that's wonderful. And there's, there's a lot to be said for, for sort of living in the world you're in and not branching out. Not, not that I'm trying to convince people not to travel because I love it a lot, but I also love traveling in my own backyard. I see one question there. Uh, it says, what were the posters without any detail information used for? Ah, Where, just stating with Sophie sorry. Tatri, for example. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the answer yes, to that. Yes, they do. I think posters that only have very limited information, like the skiers where it just said JSR, uh, I imagine those might have been overprinted by local railways and said, take this train to go visit Sturpske Pleso or take this train to go to uh, Kirkonosha or... or so on. He's good. But, uh, I really don't know. All right. Well, I, I think maybe your your advice to us to uh, to Czechoslovak Society of Arts and Sciences, New York chapter. Excuse me. Can I ask uh, you if you're uh, uh, to mute yourself if you're not one of our presenters? Uh, but maybe this is is uh, you know with your, your advice that we go see our own backyard is a good place to to bring this to an end. Uh, uh, Thank you so much, uh, Nicholas, for uh, your, your insights and for sharing this, this fantastic collection. I think uh, the response from our audience uh, indicates that the interest is, is great and that it would be worth maybe revisiting. So we'll certainly be talking about a, a, a possible uh, reprise of, of this program. Well, great, Chris. Listen, thank you. Thank SVU. Uh, Susanna, thank you. Maida, thank you. Thank you all for paying attention. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a privilege for me to be able to share these with you. And uh, I do hope we can work out a second one because I would love to do it.